Good evening and welcome to E-Bible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 23 of Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to begin by reading Revelation 6 and verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And I'll stop reading there. We have been looking at these verses for some time now, and we're, we're looking at the spiritual meaning of sun, moon, and stars. In our last study, we saw how the sun represents God. It represents the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But what of the moon? What does the moon represent? And the moon is more difficult to find definition for as we search the Bible, and and that's what we always are called upon to do. We're never to say, well, I think the moon represents this, and and uh, th- this is a good idea that it might represent such and such. No, we never are to do that. We have to find out what the Bible says, and and we're uh, able to do that when we look up the word moon and we see how God is using it. Now, what we're going to find as we uh, go into this study of the moon is that it represents the law of God. And the law of God is basically um, a synonym for the Word of God or the Bible. The Bible is a law book. Now, the moon is that interesting object mankind sees um, that lights the night sky it is um, not considered a planet by astronomers due to its its limited size, although it nearly qualifies as a planet, but it is said to be a satellite of the Earth. Now, have you ever wondered why it is that the moon lights up at night? Why um, do we see a light of the moon? And we understand the light of the sun. The sun is burning um, with, with uh, brilliance. The, the sun is giving off light. Light comes forth from the sun to light the earth. But what about the moon? Is the moon giving off any light? Is the moon producing light? Then, and is that why we're seeing it? It, at nighttime when we look up into the heavens? And the answer is no. The moon is a dead planet. It, it's, um, it, it has no ability in itself to produce light as the sun does. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. And when we look up into the night sky and we see a bright shining moon, it is a reflection of the sun due to the type of material that's on the moon. It's able to reflect the sun's rays, the sun's light, and it gives the appearance as though the moon is putting forth this light herself. Now, it's interesting when we read the Bible, what God has to say about the light of the moon. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 34, we read in, no, I'm sorry, not Isaiah 34, it's Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, we read in verse 10, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And and, uh, this is a very familiar verse to us. We have been looking at these type of verses for some time and and 
perhaps we never noticed before, but here it is basically stating that the moon is going to withhold her light. The moon shall not cause her light to shine, as if the moon was producing light, as if the moon was generating light to the earth. And, uh, well, uh, scientifically, uh, th this can't be. And how are we to understand what God is saying here, that the moon will not cause her light to shine? And, of course, we would have some secularists and uh, individuals that always want to find fault with the Bible and to criticize, say, well, you see, that's a mistake. That's an error in the scripture. God is saying that the moon will cause her own light uh, not to shine. And, and by the way, there, um, there's no mistake in this statement because in Matthew 24, um, it says in Matthew 24, verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And again, we, we find it, it said the moon will not give her light, and the word her is in the Greek text. It, it is a translation of the Greek word autes, which uh, autos is the word for self, and this is in the feminine, and it is unmistakably feminine, and, and therefore the King James translators properly and correctly, correctly translate as her. The moon shall not give her light. And, and again, um, indicating that this is a result of, well, first of all, as if the, the moon had a will of its own, and secondly, as if the will produced light that it could withhold and keep back from the inhabitants of the earth and from shining upon them. And, and uh, we, we have to wonder, uh, what is God doing with this kind of language? He, he repeats it again in Mark chapter 13 in the uh, parallel passage to Matthew 24. Mark 13, 24, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Why is the moon always spoken of, uh, it, or, or in these verses we're looking at, spoken of in the feminine? Why is God uh, identifying the moon as though she were a woman, as though she were a female? And we have to keep searching the Bible and, and keep looking into the Scripture in order to find our answer. And I think we do find our answer back in Genesis chapter 37. In the, the days of Joseph, actually, we read in Genesis 37, in verse 2, it says there, these are the generations of Jacob. And Jacob is used by God as a figure of the elect. And, and, and basically, God is stating here, these are the generations of the elect. And then he begins to talk about Joseph when he was 17 years old and the history of Joseph being um, purchased as a slave and brought into Egypt. And, and then the famine that that uh, comes along, and Joseph rising to um, the right hand of Pharaoh, and so forth. And these are the generations of God's elect. They all have information that relates to the biblical timeline of history and the end of the world when God will complete his program of salvation for his elect people. Well, Joseph was a young man of 17 when he began to dream, or, or at least when God is recording these dreams uh, that Joseph had. 
And we find in Genesis 37, in verse 9, And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Now the first thing we uh, are interested in is that the sun and moon are said to represent uh, Jacob and Joseph's mother. And, and that's interesting because Joseph's mother, Rebekah, died sometime earlier in giving birth to Benjamin. And, and so, uh, well, he, he had stepmothers as Jacob was married to other women, but it doesn't mean that um, Rebekah could not be in view here as uh, Jacob may be thinking, well, this could be something related uh, to uh, to the afterlife or to the time of the end. And, uh, you know, the Bible does teach that those that die in Christ never die, that they continue to live. But whatever Jacob was thinking about that, when he said, Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? One thing's for sure. And that is that God here is identifying the father, Jacob, as being typified by the son and the mother, um, Rebecca, or or, uh, the mother remains unnamed in this passage. The mother is being typified by the moon and Joseph's brethren, his 11 brothers, are typified by the stars. And, and this is helpful because uh, here God is uh, relating the moon to Joseph's mother, and again, uh, a female, to a woman. And, and now, though, it's um, more information because God is speaking of the moon as a mother. And that's helpful when we read um, verses such as we do in Proverbs. Let's go over to Proverbs chapter 1, and it says in verses 7 and 8, The fear of Jehovah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. The Lord here is connecting the law, uh, which again would be the word of God, the Bible, with thy mother. Forsake not the law of thy mother. He does it again in Proverbs chapter 6, in verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Again, law and mother. Uh, This um, identification uh, helps us to understand uh, why God says, for instance, in his law, honor thy father and thy mother. And we've always understood that the father typifies God himself. Uh, he, he is our heavenly father. And yet, honor thy father and thy mother. And remember what God says in Ephesians concerning this. In Ephesians chapter 6, uh, he says in, in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, of course, if someone obeys their earthly mother, that's a good thing and proper. Uh, that, that's a right thing for a child to do. But 
uh, obeying one's mother and father is not going to prolong anyone's life. Not physically, not in this world, or it, it could benefit them and make their life uh, much more joyous and 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 uh, they they can live um, in a good way. So there's certain benefit to that, but there's nothing, nothing at all that would indicate that someone who honors their parents compared to someone who doesn't honor their parents uh, lives a longer life. Yet when God says that thou mayest live long on the earth, we tend to think, oh, this is a reference not to this earth, but to the new heaven and new earth where God's people will dwell forevermore. And therefore, if an individual honors his heavenly father and mother, which is the word of God, the Bible, and how do you honor your mother? our earthly, our physical mother, the one who gave birth to us. If she tells us to do something and we don't do it, are we honoring her? No, obviously we're not. We're dishonoring her. If our mother wants us to um, hearken to the things she's saying and we do not hearken, well, there's no honoring of her in that at all. And it's the exact same thing with the law of God. The law of God, it, it admonishes us and it rebukes us. It directs the course of our life. It's very much, the Bible is very much like a mother to us. It can nourish us and comfort us and encourage us. And also, it can sharply rebuke us. And, and it directs us and it gives us uh, sound advice and wise counsel, and and like a mother, it has great concern for us and love. And if we're one of God's elect, and even for those that aren't, as God uh, has a natural sort of love for all men, it, it would be helpful for even an unsaved person to follow the laws of the Bible, and and so the word of God is like a mother that is to be honored. And if anyone were to submit in obedience to the law of the Scripture, to the Word of God, and do the things that God says here, and do them from the heart, it would mean that they had become saved and they would live long on the earth. They would live forevermore. Well, in Proverbs 30, we read in verse 11, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And, and again, God is bringing father and mother upon an equal footing. Uh, it, if they do uh, one to the father, it seems they'll do it to the mother. And, and we can understand that when we recognize that the word of God is equal with God. He has placed his name under his law. He has subjected himself to his own word. He will not violate the law of God in any way for any reason, but rather God himself obeys and keeps the perfect law that he has established forever. Now, let's um, look at verse 17 in Proverbs 30. The eye that mocketh at his father, and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. And once again, we can see here how a God, of course, is the father, and if someone mocks him, will they suffer the consequences? Likewise, if someone despises to obey his mother... And notice the word obey. They're rejecting the counsel of their mother, the direction that their mother is telling them. And they are rejecting the word of God. And they also will suffer the consequences for failing to obey. Now, let, let's just go to one other place to um, see how this 
um, connection, that see how these things are tied together, where God uh, likens a mother to his word. And uh, also, since uh, Genesis 37, in Joseph's dream, God identifies the moon as Joseph's mother. We, we have biblical validation for recognizing that the moon, which is spoken of often in the feminine as a, as a woman, is a type and figure of the law of God as a mother is a type and figure of the law of God. And in Judges chapter 4, we read something really uh, very unusual, something rare in the Bible, and that is a woman given a prominent place in a battle. In Judges 4, we read of Deborah the prophetess. And let me read verse 4. And Deborah prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, She judged Israel at that time. Now, the uh, Israelites were being oppressed by the Canaanites at that time. And and now God was going to um, raise up some deliverers. And Deborah uh, took center stage. and, And she was a prophetess, which also was rare, according to the Bible, most prophets you read of in the scripture are men. And, and some people try to point to Deborah in order to justify that a woman should teach or preach or, or do whatever a man can do. And, and they're failing to understand the rarity of, of this historical event that we're going to read a little bit about. And also they're failing to understand the deeper spiritual meaning of what God is saying here, which explains perfectly why Deborah took such a a heightened role in this battle um, with the Canaanites. We we read in verse 6 of Judges 4, And she sent and called Barak the son of Abinoam out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Has not Jehovah God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor? And take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For Jehovah shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And again, we see that that God is making sure that people can't miss that that, uh, historically, as this woman is featured, that it is not for man's honor that normally, typically, men do these things. But God is making this allowance in order to teach us something very important. Barak is a type of Christ. And notice that it says that he has um, 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun. In verse 14, we read, and, and Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which Jehovah has delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not Jehovah gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. And Jehovah discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. And uh, the, the connection or the identification, the relationship God is establishing here is hard to miss. As Barak comes with 10,000 men, we know that the Bible teaches us that Christ comes in the day of judgment with 10,000s of his saints. And Barak is a picture of Christ, and this battle is a picture of judgment day. But why 
uh, on earth would God have Barak say, I will not go with the in- unless you, Deborah, come with me to the battle. Well, again, we understand once we we realized that her name, the prophetess's name, Deborah, is the feminine form of the Hebrew word Debar. And Debar in the Hebrew is the word that is often translated as word. It, it is often used to describe the word of the Lord, the word of God. And, and Deborah is a type and a figure of the word of God, the Bible. And in the day of judgment, Barak, the Lord Jesus, comes, yes, with ten thousands of his saints, with all of the elect, but he comes with the word of God. And that's exactly what we're finding today, that God is using his word as a sword in the day of battle to destroy his enemies. Since it is a spiritual judgment that he has brought upon the earth, and this spiritual judgment is revealed from the scripture We can see why God is emphasizing that Barak does not go to this battle unless Deborah come with him. Now, over in Judges chapter 5, it says in verse 7, The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, and again, Deborah is the feminine form of Debar, which means word until I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. And this, again, presents evidence that the word of God is like a mother. And the, the mother is connected to the moon. And, and God says, in that day, in the day of judgment, the moon shall not give her light. And now we understand, of course, God isn't saying that the moon generates um, physically any uh, or produces light uh, that, that it will withhold. No, but what the moon typifies, what the moon represents is the word, is the Bible itself. And And Christ is the embodiment of the word. Christ completely identifies with the moon, therefore. He completely identifies with the word of God. And Christ will withhold the reflected light that comes from the sun. As God lightens his word, Christ, the moon, will withhold that word from the world. And the, the light reflected from the person of God to the moon, the scriptures will not shine immediately after the tribulation of those days. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. 